Jenny Kent has a story to tell. After she had released 40 pounds and reached her ideal weight, she discovered that she had breast cancer. Join me in my conversation with SHIFT member Jenny Kent, who will tell us her weight release story, but also talk about how she used a blood glucose monitor to help her get clear on what foods worked and didn't work for her, as well as how she was able to manage her weight through a breast cancer diagnosis, treatment, and beyond. Come on in and hear Jenny's story of curiosity and grit. Did you know that our struggle with weight doesn't start with the food on your plate or get fixed in the gym? 80% of our weight struggle is mental. That's right. The key to unlocking long-term weight release and management begins in your mind. Hi there, I'm Rita Black. I'm a clinical hypnotherapist, weight loss expert, best-selling author, and the creator of the Shift Weight Mastery Process. And not only have I helped thousands of people over the past 20 years achieve long-term weight mastery, I am also a former weight struggler, carb addict, and binge eater. And after two decades of failed diets and fad weight loss programs, I lost 40 pounds with the help of hypnosis. Not only did I release all that weight, I have kept it off for 25 years. Enter the Thin Thinking Podcast where you too will learn how to remove the mental roadblocks that keep you struggling. I'll give you the thin thinking tools, skills, and insights to help you develop the mindset you need, not only to achieve your ideal weight, but to stay there long-term and live your best life. Hello there, friends. Come on in. I told you that I was a little overwhelmed by September because I'd had so much going on, but it has been such an amazing month. And I want to thank you all for the warm birthday wishes and your responses to some of our podcasts this month. Thank you. I have my free masterclass coming up this Wednesday, the 28th of September, 2022. And it's called How to Break Through the Weight Struggle Cycle So You Can Lose Weight Consistently and Permanently. The link is in the show notes, so sign up now. It's your last chance to get in. Uh, And now here's what we're talking about. You all know how to lose weight. It's not about that. But it's about shifting your subconscious mind. And there are three major shifts I want to share with you that when you make them, it will change your weight release destiny. Plus, we are going to do some hypnosis. So those of you who have never tried it or love it, please come and join us. It's free and the link is in the show notes. Now, if you're coming in after the date, uh, check out the show notes. Anyway, I always leave you some love there, uh, some sort of free offer. So go get that. Um, And now I am excited to introduce you to Jenny Kent, who has been in the shift community for a couple of years now. She is a really amazing woman, as you will see, for she walks us through this really amazing story of weight release, uh, blood glucose monitoring, that's a handful or mouthful, managing her weight through breast cancer. And she's got such an amazing and curious outlook on life. I know that you are just going to love my conversation with her. So please welcome Jenny Kent. Well, welcome Jenny to the Thin Thinking Podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Sure. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for asking. <laughs> well, I am I'm so amazed and proud and well, I you have quite a shift journey. And we're going to start diving into that. But I just want to start by saying how uh, amazed I am by you as a human being and everything that you've been through since I've known you. you you're a generous person, but you're also gritty and tenacious, I I will have to say. And now I'm kind of, now everybody's like, well, how is she gritty? Whoa. How is she tenacious? <laughs> Superwoman. No. Um, But maybe just start by telling our audience a little bit about you and how it, where you were before the uh, shift process, maybe start by just telling us a little bit about how you struggled with weight initially. Sure. 
Um, well, first of all, I started the shift process about two years ago, so I really yeah. haven't been doing that all this long, but it's a lot has happened in those two years, I will say. Um, I had zero problems with my weight, honestly, and probably until I was almost 40 years old, uh, because I was, you know, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. Uh, in the Midwest, we ate good, wholesome, whole food, no snacks, dessert only on Sunday, played outside, you know, all day long. And then as a teenager, I was a very serious ballerina and I had no trouble uh, maintaining my weight. And that pretty well carried over uh, into, you know, early and middle adulthood, I didn't start having any problems now in retrospect, thinking about it till I started teaching my daughter how to bake. And that was when I was about 40. And we oh, interesting. Start, yep. And we started making all of these delicious homemade goodies. What I, I would make some of that when I was growing up, but not to the extent that, that I did. And I started overeating carbs in a big way um, and being less active with my busy, busy children. And that's when I started gaining weight at a great amount, five, 10 pounds, and then I could take it off. Well, it wasn't until I became menopausal around 50 that I really started having trouble getting it off, but I could still you know, cut way back on carbs, cut back on calories, increase my steps. Um, and, and I could, could take it off, uh, to the extent that I wanted to never being as thin as I was when I was a very skinny ballerina, but, you know, just, you know, in the one twenties and I'm five, six, so just, you know, fine. Um, and then, um, I, I went through a period as a new empty nester. Uh, I had my children late. And so we're talking getting in my mid to late fifties of being an empty nester. And that's when I started emotional eating, so to speak, feeling pretty stressed out as if I didn't have anything, you know, that was really meaningful to do anymore, except I continued to eat a lot of carbs and I gained a fair amount of weight. And I found myself at age 60 being about 40 pounds overweight. Well, I couldn't stand that and didn't let that stand for more than a couple of weeks and started doing Fitbit and counting calories and logging all my food and doing everything, which I've been doing now for about almost 10 years, right. um, all, even before I started the shift process and got most of it off. But I'd still, you know, anytime I would go on vacation and eat carbs uh, to a big extent, um, I, I could easily put the weight back on. Well, then COVID pandemic happened. And just like, every, you know, so many people, I gained about 15 pounds. I was so stressed. My husband's a practicing physician. Uh, I'm a retired physician, but he's still practicing. Um, my daughter's a practicing physician. So is her husband. They were being exposed. And I was terrified of what was going to happen. And I was just eating nonstop and gained about 15 pounds. And, and then I got this email about the shift and <laughs> inviting me to do it. I had looked at the book, hadn't really looked at, done the program at all previously, but here I was stuck at home during COVID and it was a perfect time to do it. So in October, two years ago, started the shift, started getting the daily emails and doing the daily hypnosis and really continuing kind of what I'd been doing as far as counting calories and logging my food, but, you know, up the exercise some. And, but mostly I was doing that daily hypnosis and really committing to doing it. And it almost seemed like magic that I would, it's very easy to stick with the program by watching the, or by listening to the meditation that folks me in the morning and the hypnosis at night, it was just, it was so relaxing, ended up being one of my favorite parts of the day. 
um, and and uh, you know what didn't get to participating in Facebook and all of that, but I looked at everything. Um, but I just I I really really resonated. So many things resonated with me. So many things that people would say on Facebook or or things that you or someone else would say in a group. And it, I, all of a sudden I realized that actually I had been doing a lot of emotional eating um, in response to two basic situations. And one was these overwhelming to-do lists that I would have <laughs> and these unrealistic expectations. And Rita talked about uh, you know, having unrealistic expectations when she would come home from a vacation. And, and it was like, yeah, I do that all the time. Mm. So I worked on that. And that's really one of my non-scale victories is that I learned how to make realistic but challenging to-do lists that I actually can actually accomplish. I know. So I'm I, just going to stop you for a second there just to say, I know you say it's non-scale, but it has so much to do with long-term permanent weight management, yep. managing your expectations. And I think something that you're, you had probably going in even before the shift, but I'm curious about, well, go ahead and finish your other thing, but I want to ask you about your inner coach. So go, go oh, ahead. Okay. But, then- but you, and then, and then the other thing was, I, I knew I was eating in response to being afraid. I mean, like yeah, the situation, fear. for instance, fear of, you know, fear of COVID, fear of the unknown. Mm. And, you know, those, that was, that was a big one for a lot of people during the pandemic. I mean, nobody knew what was going on and, you know, it was, I mean, fear of getting a fatal illness, you know, it was just, it was overwhelming to me and it was overwhelming about my family. And so when I realized that and could go, Hmm, what's going on here? I, you know, uh, take a deep breath, which Rita calls a shift breath, but also just say, hmm, what's going on? Um, I could stop and prevent myself from grabbing something to eat because I wasn't hungry. And so, you know, over over the course of the next six months, um, with varying manipulations of of my macros and what have you at different times. I lost basically a pound a week. Uh, I didn't lose it like steadily every single week. I'm the queen of plateaus. I'll go like, I'll lose like four pounds and then I'll plateau for like four weeks and then I'll lose another four pounds. And But if you look at the Fitbit average, it looks like I'm losing exactly a pound a week for six months. Right. And it was, it was the most weight I'd lost since I'd been pregnant the last time. Wow. Yeah. So it it was, it was, it was amazing. Well, I think you brought up a couple of things that was, uh, that was, uh, that's interesting to me. One, I want to point out to our listeners who, who might be like Jenny struggling with plateaus. I find that over 45, most women release weight that way. You know, a cl- uh, you, you lose it in chunks, right? You'll, you'll plateau, 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 drop, plateau, 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 drop. As before uh, 45, you know, we're more used to it being easier and it kind of just, you know, coming off more steadily. Uh, it, I don't know. I don't have the exact explanation why, but I've just seen seen that as a general trend. But something that you were also saying was that in that moment, you took that shift breath, you kind of did something else, which was you reasoned with yourself and you had a moment, you slowed down the moment and you had a conversation with yourself. And in that conversation, the, the more mature Jenny spoke to the scared Jenny and said, it's, you know, it's, we can be okay here. And that's what I would call your inner coach, you know, and, and that is something that we really focus on a lot in the shift because most of what the challenge is when we struggle with our weight is an inner communication challenge, not as much, you know, we, I know Jenny, it sounds like she knows, she knew how to lose weight. Like she knew how to, uh, eat less, exercise more. She, she had the basics down, but that, that what changed for you was the way that you were communicating with yourself throughout and, you know, making different 
tweaks, but I, I'll let you speak to that. But that was the thing that I absolutely, wanted to highlight. Absolutely. You know, I don't, I really don't think that I realized the extent to which those were issues for me. And I don't think I spoke to myself at all, except to just be in a tizzy and, and, and never really trying to, um, you know, you know, talk myself down out of some of these feelings or try to find out what was underneath these feelings that, that, um, you know, may or may not have been causing me to eat, but cause that wasn't a problem until, you know, much later in life. Um, the other thing is, is that when, when later in life I started turning to carbohydrates, that kind of has a life of its own as well. And, and so some of it doesn't really seem to be emotional eating as much as it is just almost like a sugar addiction that you right. just can't control. And you call that the carb zombie, which I think is a, a lovely way to, to, to you know, <laughs> think about that. Cause it, it's like something takes over. That's a zombie. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I think that we've talked about this too, which is as we get older and go through menopause, I see most women become a lot more sugar sensitive. Like we become Absolutely. more insulin resistant and uh, just naturally. And then, so your baking with your daughter might be, maybe started a little trend of we'll eat the sugar, then we'll feel hungrier, then we'll want more food. And then, and then it starts its own life of its own. And then the dopamine center in the brain gets used to it and then it wants it. And that's what I call the carb zombie is this more, uh, it's almost like we are putting food in our mouth and saying, why am I doing this? I'm not even hungry. I'm not even experiencing the food, but I seem to just get caught up in this, uh, uh, you know, craziness, which. Well, that, that, and, and so about halfway through my shift, so starting in October, it started in October and then I believe it was in January, um, Rita, you had a, a program that was called Carb Rehab. I yes, guess. yes. And and it was it was a deeper dive into that that issue and and you know what what carbohydrates were doing. Well, I had been, you know, I I love self help books about every uh, topic. Um, you know. I, you know, disclosure, I'm a retired psychiatrist and all this stuff. It's just kind of fun for me to read. And so I, I, you know, but I also like to just read about health. And I read a book right at the time we were doing carb rehab and talking about carbs. Um, that's called Why We Get Sick. It's by a PhD metabolic scientist by the name of Dr. Ben Bickman. One of the really, really good book. And it, you know, about, and he's, he's a med, he's an insulin specialist, a metabolic disease specialist, a fat cell biologist, um, and wrote a book for the general public to try to understand metabolic disease and about the contribution of insulin resistance to a gazillion of our chronic diseases. It's the fertile ground for a lot of illnesses. It isn't the sole cause but cancer, dementia, diabetes, you know, all, you know, hypertension, all sorts of, of, of illnesses can, you know, ha be contributed to by insulin resistance. Right. And so I got, I got interested in trying to, well, first of all, assuming that I was insulin resistant because, uh, latest information is in, in the United States about, um, 93% of people are not metabolically healthy. Wow. That, that it's gone up since the pandemic. Um, and it, it, you know, you don't have a full blown metabolic syndrome, but you'll have some indication like early hypertension or lipid problems or whatever of metabolic disease. Interesting. And so, and I didn't so, know the number was that high. That's that astonishing. Out. And so, so I assumed that I was insulin resistant and, and you can't, there is no such thing as a continuous insulin monitor, but there is such a thing as a continuous glucose monitor that diabetics have been using for a number of years. And now there are some young startup companies uh, and, uh, that are trying to help you get healthy uh, and they prescribe these continuous insulin monitor or, or um, glucose monitors to help you manage your blood sugar and your blood sugar spikes to keep 
your blood sugar down, which means that you're keeping your insulin down. Right. Well, um, so I started at the same time as carb rehab doing this uh, continuous glucose monitor. And I found out all sorts of really cool things. First of all, that I wasn't a diabetic, which I didn't think I was, but that my, my blood sugar would spike way more than I thought it should uh, to all sorts of, of foods that I already knew I would get super hungry afterwards a lot sooner than I thought, like a banana or like mm -hmm. a big apple or like oatmeal or even a piece of bread or crackers or right. what have you. And so I learned this and I also, I, I then realized, I used to think I got hypoglycemic. I wasn't getting hypoglycemic. Seeming, it was just that my blood sugar was coming down because the insulin was there mm. bringing it down, and it was the feeling associated with my blood sugar coming down after a spike that would cause me to have another snack, spike yes. the insulin again, you know. And so I'd get on this roller coaster all day long, where I would be, even when I was shifting, eating small meals to try to keep in my calorie count, but feeling hungry a lot of the time, and so that helped me. Uh, realized that I needed to decrease my carbs and certain carbs and made some other adjustments in the way I ate them uh, in order to limit those spikes. And then I wouldn't be so hungry. Could I, and I want to mention something here because I've listened to some podcasts about continuous glucose monitors. Cause I do find that the, what we did that process carb rehab, and even in the shift process, because we have a workshop called carb savvy, we get into tuning into our bodies, which we rarely do, but we start to look at, oh, when I eat this food, how do I feel after? It's not just about the food itself. I think we get into, and I think something you mentioned, Jenny, was that some of these foods that you were eating weren't unhealthy foods. They were what right. you would deem a healthy whole food, like oatmeal or a banana. And something that one of these podcasts said that uh, was interesting to me, and then I went on to learn more, is that every body is different. So you, Jenny could spike with a banana, somebody else might not, uh, But and Jenny could eat ice cream and it wouldn't spike, but that other person might spike with with ice cream right so, it's your genes your genes it's your gut microbiome uh, metabolizing things differently it's all there are all sorts of variables yeah you know, so it's, it's it, not a way to know there's but, not but, across the board like don't eat right. this do eat that and right. that's why it's so important to um for you for us as people who are are really tuning into our weight and having a more powerful relationship with food to really start to look at it, not from good or bad, but what does this food give me? And, and so you got a clearer insight into that, but if you don't can't afford to do a blood glucose uh, monitor, uh, cause I think they're a little pricey. I don't know what they cost, but they're pretty um, pricey. Yeah. Uh, but what so you're we're talking do, like, uh, 250 a month. Okay. Yeah. So, so if yeah. that's beyond your reach, one thing I would say, maybe Jenny, you have uh, other advice because you, you, you know, have been tuned into this is really pay attention, especially when you eat what I would call a naked carb, a carb without a protein or vegetable, like something that is uh, a carb that you're eating on its own on an empty stomach, but really start to notice how you feel an hour afterwards, three hours afterwards. This was something we did in carb rehab was we just tuned into how we felt the next morning, because once you start to get a clearer picture, then like what Jenny is saying, you have a lot more control over your appetite and that carb zombie, like we talk about hibernating the carb zombie uh, by not just necessarily cutting carbs and taking your carbs low, but, but really creating a way of eating that allows you to not trigger that carb zombie that allows you to feel fed and nourished and not uh, too hungry all the time, which I think when we're overeating or spiking our blood sugar, we feel hungry constantly, but we could be way overeating calories that way more than we right. need. And, and I, th I think that you can do this without a blood glucose monitor by particularly paying attention to avoiding, um, uh, as Dr. Bickman said, uh, uh, avoiding bags and boxes with barcodes of snacky food. <laughs> Be, uh, you know, that. The, the ultra, the ultra processed carbs, yeah. because that's what's probably 
going to be the thing that's going to spike your blood sugar. The other thing for me is that it's pretty much the, the trigger foods, the things that I can't say no to, to yes. more, more than one. I, I mean, it's like if I don't have those triggers around, and then, and I, I moderate the portions of like an apple or like a banana or whatever, um, then I'm okay. And, oh, the other thing you can do is take a walk after eating, uh, your muscles take up glucose without needing insulin. And then you won't have as big of a spike. There's other little things. There's some, there's a woman called the glucose goddess. Yes. Uh, and she's got a lot of, she's got a book. She's mm-hmm. got a book, uh, Glucose Revolution, and she's got a lot of hacks. And so n- none of it requires a continuous glucose monitor. But it was just fun for somebody who's kind of a science, sciencey nerd and, and well, stuff. So, so absolutely. And I think that, you know, with the shift as well, we are very we focus on data because data helps our brain calm down when we are sure. emotionally run, you know. So um, and so having this extra piece of data, even though this might not be something everybody goes and does um, for you was helpful just to kind of right. get things in perspective for yourself. So, so, cool. so that helped me. And I just, you know, I just chugged along and it, you know, over six months, just pretty, you know, with, you know, within the realm of plateaus, steadily lost that weight that I wanted to lose. And I, I found myself at the end of April 21 uh, at my, what I considered my goal weight, ideal weight, whatever you want to call it. And it just happened to coincide with my 40th anniversary. And it was like, I was absolutely on top of the world. I wanted to be in photographs for the first time in a long time. Wow. I couldn't get enough photographs of myself. It's like, oh my God, is that me? Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I had a bounce in my step. I, you know, my family was wonderful. My husband was wonderful. Everything's wonderful. I, I'm, uh, you know, going on a on a romantic vacation to the Caribbean I'm in a hotel room and I'm standing in front of the hotel mirror getting dressed after a shower and my heart sank next shoe to drop oh my god well so I don't normally get dressed in front of a mirror because I just don't that's not the way my bathroom is set up and so I was at this hotel and raised my arm to put my arm in a sleeve and just happened to see a little depression in the underside of my breast. And I'm a physician. I wasn't, you know, like looking at this rose colored glass. It was like, Oh crap. Are you kidding me? I mean, you know, I have, you know, really other than having been mildly overweight at times in my adult life, but not dramatically, um, no risk factors for breast cancer. And I was absolutely shocked. Well, within days I was back home getting a breast biopsy and, and of course had, had uh, early stage estrogen positive breast cancer. Thank God it was early stage. I do believe uh, that I was looking at my breasts and could see it more easily because of the fact that I had lost some weight. Yeah. And and was kind of admiring myself, like, oh, I look pretty good, you know. <laughs> and and you know, it, it just it, it it was what it was. It was it was for a period of several weeks pretty terrifying because you don't know what the pathology is going to show. Uh, you don't know until you've had, you know, the, the partial mastectomy, what you're going to look like afterwards, or if it's going to have spread at, to the lymph nodes, whether you're going to need chemo, what, you know, what, what you're going to need. It was about, about six weeks of a lot of uncertainty. And I really, truly, you know, I did not, I did not completely freak out um, because I honestly had really started to be able to talk to myself and kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, not catastrophize, I think, because 
um, of some of the techniques that I had learned in talking to myself about my weight and in the shift. I really do believe that. Right. And, and my family was fantastic. My, my children came from out of town at, at different times and were always available to talk to me on the phone when I needed, you know, talking down. But I can assure you in the past, I would have eaten myself into oblivion. And I had no... I, that that wasn't anything I wanted to do. I was absolutely determined that this was not going to mess up this wonderful bounce I had in my step about what I felt like in life right now. So I got through the surgery. It wasn't fun. I, you know, got through radiation, which was a body slam that I wasn't expecting. You don't have any energy for a while and it's, it's not fun. Um, but your immune system's kicking in and that's why you feel like that. Um, and then wow. started a medication that I'll be on for years and years, an estrogen blocker called an aromatase inhibitor. And it should, you know, in all likelihood, give me a normal lifespan. Um, there's no reason to think it won't. And so now I don't go every day and thinking about my breast cancer. I just don't. I, I you know, I'm just living life and and dealing with some side effects from this medication uh but trying to to navigate um you know life on this medication it causes you to have a little mental fogginess um it causes uh some metabolic changes i mean you're you're basically doing away with estrogens made in your fat cells too and other you know it, this prevents androgens being from being turned into estrogens. And so you have zero estrogen. And, and so it, it, you know, there are estrogen receptors uh, and I'm sure that that has something to do with the metabolic changes. Um, I don't, you know, I have tried to read about everything I could find about it and yeah, there's weight gain associated with this medication, uh, you know, and, and, and you all, went through but, a you journey know, with that you know, too, I yeah. know, but through, through the, through the initial cancer phase, you, you were maintaining your weight. I was, and I, you know, I, I gained a couple pounds because my children were bringing me cookies and things and, <laughs> and you know, and nobody wants to see somebody with cancer lose weight. Yeah. And so, you know, and it was like, okay, I'll eat some cookies. And so, but I got that right back off. It was just when I was started on this medication, uh, to block estrogen, um, you know, after the radiation was done, uh, that I started to put on a little weight, not a lot, um, but enough that it bothered me, you know, eight yeah. pounds maybe. Yeah. Um, and, and so it was like, I'm going to get this off. So I've been trying all sorts of things. Again, the inner scientist in me has been trying to find ways, you know, cutting carbs, cutting more calories, doing more exercise, doing everything I could think of. Well, I was not having any luck getting the scale to move down. And my breast surgeon said, you know, I have a bunch of patients in the same position. And the only thing I've seen is for them to have a six to eight hour eating window. So intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. So about a month ago, I started doing that and I've had excellent uh, success. Time will tell if that will last, but I've lost most of that weight now that I put on. So I'm pretty, pretty pleased with that. Right. I, I yeah. And we were talking about before we turned on the recording, if that has, because intermittent fasting allows you to regulate your hormones to a certain degree. Right. Uh, and your, in your blood sugar, if having done that allowed that, that one, just that extra weight that you had probably released maybe to even drop off. I mean, it's hard to right. tell, but it's right. It's, right. Yeah. But it's right. fascinating. And it's, and it's what I hear from your story. And this is why I, I pre I pre coded our conversation with the fact, like, listen to the amount of grit and tenacity you had with your commitment to not just your weight release, but to your health and to your well-being. And I think Jenny, uh, is she, you know, she is a doctor. She is somebody who reads things, but I do encourage everybody to read about 
uh, get curious about other aspects of your health other than just your weight, because I do think it does help you on your weight journey to be armed with additional information about blood sugar, about uh, all the different uh, factors of, uh, I mean, and, and I think the, the, what was the, I'll, I'll put, I'll put a link to that other book in the um, show notes. What was the name of the, that? Book? Oh, Ben Beckman's book. Yeah. Uh, Why we get sick. Yeah, yeah. Ben Beckman. Yeah. Because I think, uh, and then I think, I think then the, the glucose goddess's book is glucose revolution. Glucose revolution. Okay. And I, and I, I don't agree with everything that she says as far no, as the science behind speak. it, but, but there's still a lot yeah. of, a lot she's, of uh, hints, hacks, so to speak. Yeah. She's, uh, she's a fascinating helpful. person. She's a layman. She's not a doctor and she's, and she never struggled with her weight. She's French. She, but she, um, just got, she had her own illness and she realized right. that she got a glucose monitor and it helped her. Uh, I'm not, maybe, you know, what her illness was, but it helped her with her digestion and it helped her kind of correct whatever the illness was. And that's why she got so into it because she was, and then, so she shows the different, uh, and she does have some worthy hacks to look at as far as managing your right. appetite. I mean, there, and you know, There are and a lot that. of more mainstream uh, people that are recommending the same hacks. So, um, but you know, it, again, all these things can be done without a continuous glucose monitor. And, you know, again, you know, I think when I first started the shift, it was all about the number on the scale still, you know, the old diet mentality. Yeah. And I think then in my evolution through my my cancer diagnosis and everything. Um, first of all, I realized before even that, that it was never about a number on the scales about how I felt about myself. And I was yeah. feeling so darn good. And I still do feel good about yeah. myself. And then it also evolved into, well, I need to be uh, doing certain things because of my health. I had never considered myself to have a major health problem. Well, obviously I did. So, um, you know, so now it's, it's about how I feel about myself, how I talk to myself and, and about health and longevity. And yeah. it's not at all about the number on the scale. It hasn't been for a while. Yeah. Well, I think as you evolve on your journey, your, what I would call your weight mastery journey, once you take that weight off, it has to, the journey has to deepen, you know, or else you'll yep. gain weight back. And, right. and that's what I'm saying is that I think a lot of people expect, well, I'm going to lose the weight. And then just live happily ever after, but it's a continuing relationship with yourself, your health. And that's why what you've done, which is like gotten curious about other things, gotten, it kind of keeps the game, it keeps you in the game in a different way. And, right. and I do believe for, especially us women over 50, 55, uh, longevity really does start to get a little more interesting and, and getting curious about that. And I certainly know for me, right. And I, that, and I that, think many of us the have the role in our family of, of making sure that the rest of our family are healthy and yes. are concerned, concerned about their longevity. And so the more, you know, about it for yourself, the more, you know, you, I mean, I, not to disparage men, but you know, I, I think that <laughs> they don't of, do anything. Women are more interested <laughs> in the health aspects. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's helpful to be armed with some knowledge, um, you know, that they might be interested in uh, to get them healthy as well. Did your husband get healthier as you went on your journey? My husband has been disgustingly healthy forever. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, he's so one he's... of those thin, thin guys, rides a Peloton, does okay. the tonal weightlifting, okay. does, you know, works, you know, full time in a busy practice and will never retire and has more energy than anybody you can think of. So, so he's a no, super he disciplined. Really, so now, yeah, he's always been in intermittent faster. He's never eaten breakfast. So, yeah. you know, interesting. Yeah. So. Interesting. But you have your whole family now monitoring their glucose and, right. and, right. and that's a fun game you all play together now, yes. which I think yes. is, is yes. nice. Yes. Yes. And they're amazed at how much mom knows about all this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are, you are an expert. You, you are, you should be the. I'm no expert. Oh my God. But if you want to listen to some interesting, uh, you know, think podcasts, they're out there like, you know, Dr. Bickman has a very, you know, understandable, accessible, uh, to the public, uh, you know, takes on all of this stuff. And, 
you don't have to, you know, do intermittent fasting, but you better consider your carbohydrates and, and, yeah. and uh, you know, consider the issue of insulin resistance because almost all of us are. Wow. Well, I'm going to definitely uh, put his book and the glucose goddess, the glucose revolution links in the show notes. Um, is there anything for, if somebody was considering, you know, taking their first step on their weight mastery journey, any advice that you would give them, Jenny, about taking those first steps? No, I think that, that if one is doing, you know, the shift process that one can take, one is designing one's own process. I think that's what you have to realize. And you can, you can listen to it all and take it in and decide what you are and aren't going to do. As time goes on, you probably end up doing it all, but because it'll, it'll, make, <laughs> it'll, it'll make more sense as time goes on. But if you were starting out doing the shift, which I highly recommend, it's never failing to do the meditations or hypnosis daily, because that's what got me engaged in the, in the process. I'm absolutely mm. convinced to begin with it. You know, I mean, I mean, it, there's parasympathetic and all this stuff going on, you know, the, the, and you, yeah, you're focusing on it and you're accessing the subconscious but you're just, it's also like super relaxation. Mm. And, uh, it, it, I I really truly believe that's what got me hooked on Mm. doing it and then making all these other changes and then taking it at your own pace and doing what you, you know, intuitively what I mean, everybody that's listening to this has been a dieter and they know what's healthy and what's not healthy, quote unquote, Mm. um, you know, it's just, do what you intuitively think is right at your own pace and, and, and design your own program with, but keeping in mind the, the recommendations uh, that the shift has uh, because I've ended up doing it all and it's been incredibly helpful. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jenny. It's been so wonderful to have you in the community uh, too. You've been such a champion for other people and Jenny will be, a coach of the upcoming shift uh, in the fall. Um, Thank you for your time today. This has been really great. I really uh, love talking to you. You're so curious about so many things. It's, it's, uh, I'm a little long winded. I apologize. No, you're not long winded. You, you, you kept it fascinating. I'm telling you it's, it is, you know, and I really admire the way you went through your cancer diagnosis and all that whole process with such grace. And I'm sure you are very proud of that journey as well. You know, it's so scary to get something like that and to get to the other side. And uh, I want to thank you for being an inspiration for other people who may have just gotten a diagnosis or, you know, are afraid of something like that. Absolutely. Uh, but who amongst us is not going to have to deal with some major oh. life issue uh, yeah. that's stressful? And, you know, a- again, you know, learning how to listen to yourself and, 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 and talk yourself down out of some situations um, th- that are some of the things you practice while you're doing the shift technique is helpful in so, so many life situations. Yeah illness or otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. I think having that inner coach and that ability to problem solve and know that there is a solution for pretty much everything. And that was something that you brought up earlier. Those two main things about uh, the emotional eating and the other lists that you made. I think a lot of people have main issues that never get resolved because they're just focused on the food only and, and, you know, on a diet or off a diet. But once you sort of start to get under the lid of some of the behaviors that we have and start to solve those problems, like I didn't tell Jenny what to do. Jenny figured those out for herself. You get so much confidence from that because you finally cure. It's not like you cure yourself, but you finally figure out those problems and create your own solutions and move through that. And that's really what 
the key to long-term permanent weight management is. It's not being perfect on a diet. It's figuring out the problems that have always taken you back to the food, the self-sabotage. And once you clear the way and then have the tools to continue to clear the way, that is what the key to long-term permanent weight management is. So, so thank you for spelling it out so beautifully and, uh, and, and also adding on those, you know, uh, so many interesting um, resources as well. I think we'll all probably be curious about a lot of these things. So uh, thank you so much, Jenny. I hope you Absolutely. have uh, a wonderful, uh, uh, is your anniversary coming up now? Or do you have another anniversary? No, but my, my husband has a big birthday and we are going on a, an extended European vacation in a couple of weeks. So, oh, amazing. yeah. And, you know, I think my intermittent fast will work perfectly. I won't eat breakfast and then I'll eat a great lunch and dinner and I won't have to deprive myself of anything and I'll do lots of walking and I will bet anything I'll come back weighing the same. I bet you will too. And I love your confidence. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Jenny, thank you so much. It was so fantastic to have you on today. Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Jenny. I so appreciate you and all you have been through. Just a reminder now, we have that master class coming up this Wednesday, the 28th of September, 2022. It's free. The link is in the show notes. It's called How to Break Through the Weight Struggle Cycle so that you can lose weight consistently and permanently. Go sign up. I will look forward to seeing you there. If you can't make the times, just know I will also send out a replay. So just make sure you sign up if you can't make it. So have an amazing week and remember that the key and probably the only key to unlocking the door of the weight struggle is inside you. So keep listening and find it. If you want to dive deeper into the mindset of long-term weight release, head on over to www.shiftweightmastery.com. That's www.shiftweightmastery.com where you'll find numerous tools and resources to help you unlock your mind for permanent weight release, tips, strategies, and more. And be sure to check the show notes to learn more about my book, From Fat to Thin Thinking, Unlock Your Mind for Permanent Weight Loss.